We represent two people on the same side of a transaction that don't get along, that oppose one another and that have different um, goals and perspectives. So we have to really have good schooling in psychology. My guest today is truly an expert in the divorce real estate niche. She's built a great business serving the family law community, and she's also the founder of the Alumni Institute, where she helps to educate real estate agents on how to become a certified divorce real estate expert. With me today, the one and only Laurel Starks. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. I'm excited. So um, let me, before we jump into it, how did you get into this divorce niche uh, in the first place? So uh, my second listing that I ever took was um, a divorce listing. And, and I just, it sort of just fell into my lap, so to speak. And um, I was contacted by a woman who had just left court. She had gotten um, this order to sell the house and she was referred to me and got my name. And so had to, had to list and sell it with me. Um, and she had to be up in Oregon in 30 days so that her son could start school. Um, I met with her and she told me all the gory details about her divorce and all the horrible monstrous things that had happened and her husband and all of these sorts of things. And then, um, she told me that she didn't think he was going to be very cooperative and that they were not speaking and there was a restraining order against him. And so I made contact with him and he was, um, he, she was right. He said, I'm not going to cooperate with you. I'm not going to, I'm not having anything to do with this. I'm not signing anything. Just forget my number. Cause I'm never talking to you again. And, uh, he was true to his word. He didn't, um, talk to me ever again. And he was on title. And so like, how do you sell a house with somebody who's refusing to talk to you, cooperate or sign anything? How do you wow. do this? Right. Yeah. So, um, I found myself in court for the first time. I'd never stepped foot in a courthouse and I was uh, on a witness stand telling a judge what had gone on. And um, I realized then that our industry was just lacking training. I mean, I had no idea how to navigate or manage this. I stumbled my way through. And then I got um, another case and then I got another case. My name just sort of got passed around. And um, I realized also not only were realtors not educated, like there weren't realtors, there wasn't anything for us, but I also learned that lawyers were not educated on real estate. And so mm -hmm. they were advising their clients to do things that, uh, were going to set them up for failure. They were advising them to, you know, to, to, to sell the house at a certain price or to do, you know, like stipulating these different terms and whatnot. And, um, and I was finding that divorcing families were really, um, screwed because these lawyers didn't have somebody in the real estate industry that they could trust. And they didn't have anybody really educating them. And they were getting their values off of Zillow. I mean, it was, it's a nightmare. So I realized that, you know, there's this disconnect between our industry and their industry. And as realtors, we have a, a stigma that we have to overcome because lawyers don't trust realtors. They don't, they think that we're car salesmen. Um, and yet we've got a lot of value that we can bring that they need. And, um, and I was on a quest to figure out what that value was and then how to get it to them. Um, so that ultimately divorcing homeowners and families can be um, set up for, you know, the quickest recovery that they can. I mean, they're in crisis, so they need, they need to be able to, to rebound from, from their nightmare and the role that we play in their case can have a direct impact on their ability to recover and how quickly they recover. I love it. I love it. Makes total sense. I agree with you a million percent. I mean, our industry has to do a better job serving that community, which is pretty much your life's work now. And we're going to unpack all of that today. And so the thing I, I also like about 
what you say about this niche is it's really a bulletproof business. Unlike buying leads from Zillow and you know all the ups and downs of the marketplace, um, I think that the divorce niche offers a consistent practice in real estate that mm -hmm. you know most agents aren't used to. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, a hundred percent. And so, so tell me really quick your opinion because. The unfortunate reality is divorce is something that is real. It's mm -hmm. not going away. It's consistent, uh, you know, uh, in a bad way, I guess. And it doesn't matter what the market's doing. It doesn't matter what interest rates are doing. It doesn't matter uh, what Zillow's doing or what the internet is doing. Um, is that kind of, do, do you talk a lot about that? Yeah, completely. I mean, it it can, it the, the business is still there. It's just, where we have to pivot isn't the lead generation piece. Where we have to pivot is how we handle the business. In other words, in a downward market, um, I got really good at short sales because that was what I had coming to me. I got cases that they were the parties are upside down on the house and they have to sell it. So I had to get really good at short sales. Um, and then with the market, you know, that his, that is in an upswing, um, obviously you get really good at, um, at, at handling, you know, regular traditional real estate. Um, we now have got some interesting characteristics that are arising as a result of COVID and the pandemic and, um, and all of that, that we have to pivot for as well. But the lead generation piece of it is consistent. It's that is the same. It's just maintaining relationships with family law attorneys and being their source of news um, on what's going on in our industry. The, lawyers get asked all these questions by their clients. I mean, the sure. clients expect the lawyers to know everything about everything. And so they're naturally asked questions about you know, how much should they sell the house? Should they sell the house? Can they qualify? Um, you know, what is, when's the best time? I mean, all of these questions they're asking their lawyer and their lawyers need to be equipped with either the right answer or half an answer. And by the way, call Laurel. <laughs> yeah, I love <laughs> it. I love it. So it makes, makes total sense. And I think the thing that I like so much about the niche is to your point, it doesn't matter if interest rates are high or not, people get divorced. It doesn't matter if we're in a buyer or seller's market, people get divorced. And so I think it can bring a level of consistency to, mm -hmm. to an agent's business where most agents' businesses are very inconsistent. So um, what is the difference, Laurel, between the traditional sale and the divorce real estate part uh, transaction that, that most agents maybe get wrong or messing up what are a couple of those things that are different from just your, your, your normal sale? Yeah, so um, I would say there are three components, really. Number one is not realtors not having a fundamental understanding of how the family court has jurisdiction over the sale. So we typically just get a listing and we just kind of go off and handle the listing. But in a divorce case, there is a court that's involved and the court has got power and the court has, you know, the ultimate jurisdiction over it. So really understanding that that's a real um, like high level um, sort of description, but there are a lot of tentacles that go along with that. Um, so that's one thing. Number two, it is really how to manage the conflict mm. with the with the parties we are dealing with people at their absolute worst there's a saying in in the legal industry that um in criminal law you've got the worst people showing up as their best self mm. so you've got the gangbanger who's dressed up in a suit sure very sure. polite to the judge right yeah, yeah, yeah. And absolutely. then in family law, you've got good people at their worst. Interesting. 
So um, whether or not, you know, there is some, whether or not we've got clients who are just naturally high conflict, um, they've got a lot of our clients have got personality disorders, they've got substance abuse, um, domestic violence. So we've got people who have had like these chronic um, things going on. And then we have people who maybe it's kind of, I almost call it situational, like mm. situational, you know, depression or situational um, things that they become dependent on substances. Uh, they become, um, you know, almost uh, sort of um, depressed, et cetera, because of what's happening to them right now. So our clients, we we represent two people on the same side of a transaction that don't get along, that oppose one another and that have different um, goals and perspectives. So we have to really have good schooling in psychology on identifying these behaviors and learning how to manage these behaviors. There's a book right here. I'm a big student of um, Bill Eddy. He is a lawyer and licensed clinic social worker. Um, he is the founder of the High Conflict Institute. And so all of his works and teachings are all about high conflict. This is a book right here. It's called, So What's Your Proposal? And it says, shifting high conflict people from blaming to problem solving in 30 seconds. So I just have all these little handbooks and, and you know, I've taken tons and tons of courses on working and managing high conflict. It's helped me be a better parent. I've got two teenage boys. Yeah. Um, so that's number two. Number two is really managing and handling, learning how to manage and handle that piece. Number three is recognizing that these listings are oftentimes distressed. So, you know, you've got people, does not matter what price point you're in. Um, you've got people whose finances are completely stretched and you've got one income that went to support a family that now has to support two households in addition to all the attorney's fees, right? So it's not uncommon to find um, houses, you know, that are behind in mortgage payments. There might be foreclosure proceedings that have started. There can be, I get a lot of IRS liens and judgments and child support liens and stuff like that. So my short sale days really help me, um, deal with that. But knowing that these can be distressed, you know, distressed sales and people sometimes just don't make house payments out of spite. Sure. Um, as well. So, you know, those are three, three main components. I would say that realtors dealing in this space, um, will, will need to need to learn. Yeah. I mean, the complex, I mean, to your point, the complexity of a divorce real estate case is unlike any traditional real estate transaction, quite frankly. And I think that's a really good point. So, you know, if an agent, watches this, which they will, and wants to start going down this path of becoming an expert in, in divorce real estate. I typically, from a coaching standpoint and from a leadership standpoint, I typically give the advice, and I say it all the time with my students, that the learning is in the doing, that I want you to go out there and fail. This is the one thing that I, that I give different advice on. And I think you'd agree, but I want your... I think that an agent, if they say, okay, I want to, I want to, Laurel, make this part of my business, that you've got to start educating yourself, becoming the expert before you start going out and going, uh, trying to build your business this way. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that, absolutely. Um, especially if you want to get into the, the, the divorce attorney referral, you know, court appointment, sort of a, a of a, um, which we're going to talk about that. Yep. Yeah. Um, so these listings, there's a lot riding on them. The stakes are very high and stakes are high. Anytime you sell a house. I mean, it's usually the largest asset and the largest debt a person has most Perfect. of the time. Um, these are, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of an asset, if not more, uh, that are, that are on our shoulders. So it's always, you know, the stakes are always high, what we have going on in a family law case. I would say that the stakes are, you know, triple. 
because this is what this family has to, um, to restart their lives. It is all the money that they've got. Uh, the more conflict that goes on in the sale of the house, the more it's going to cost them in attorney's fees. So if we as a realtor, if I can't put out fires among my clients, then they're going to have to go and, and get their lawyers involved and maybe even a judge involved. And that costs to the tune of 300, 400, 500, $600 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, one hearing is anywhere from three to $5,000 per party per side. Mm -hmm. So if, if I can't put out the, the fires when it comes to, you know, what offer to accept, my clients are going to be spending that much money on their attorneys going into court. Um, so we've got a lot, you know, we've got a lot on our shoulders and also the many other aspects of the case are kind of waiting for us. Like right, right. when the house sells now, dad's going to move 20 miles away. Um, you know, mom needs the money so that she can put down on, you know, a new place to live or whatever custody arrangements are dictated by all of that. Um, if, if we've got listings that have, a a lot of liens or they've got forbearances that weren't calculated and you know all of these things um then it impacts how much they're going to walk away with how much they're going to walk away with is all sort of figured out and calculated um with with other aspects of the case mom might get the equity in the house while dad gets to keep the pension but that's assuming that they're going to walk away with an even amount Right. And if at the end of the day, like at the 11th hour, we're like, oh, well, there was a forbearance and there's an IRS lien. And so your equity just shrunk in half. Well, that kind of undoes. They have to unwind all of these other negotiations that they've done. So it's important that we, I mean, we've got to have like surgical precision when we are handling these. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense. And, you know, they say there's three big, big stresses in life, death, divorce, and selling a house. And so in this case, you're dealing with two of life's biggest stresses all at the same time. So that makes a ton of sense. So step one, you would say is, is to educate yourself, become an expert before you start building your business in this niche, which we're going to talk about how they can get educated. And uh, at the end of this interview, uh, once they, once they are educated, um, from a lead generation standpoint, I, I believe your position is, a, is, is um, unlike going consumer direct. This is going through the channel of relationships with the family law attorneys first through a referral relationship versus going to the consumer that's going through a divorce direct. Is that accurate? Yeah. And so, um, you know, we have heard for years, I mean, as long as you and I have been in business, how many times have you been to a seminar or a class or anything having to do with lead generation? And somebody always throws out the idea right. of let's, you know, go get divorce listings. How do you get divorce listings? Go build relationships with divorce lawyers. I mean, it's not a novel idea. It's it's talked about all the time. And yet how many people do we know that are peppering stages all over the nation, killing it in the divorce space? Not very many. <laughs> no. And so the reason why is because um, what you just said, realtors get in, get into it and they are not equipped yet. Um, I mean, my husband just got his hip replaced. It sounds like he's really old, but he's not. He just was a BMX Poor operator. guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when, when we went into the surgeon, you know, it wasn't as, as though the surgeon um, was like, you know, I decided I wanted to replace hips. And so I just put some Facebook ads out there and hung a shingle. And then I got this patient, but um, I'll figure out how I'm going to do it. Like once we get into the OR, I'm going to like figure out how to do this. Great point. Wasn't, totally agree. It wasn't like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he had gone to school for how long? 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think as realtors, we need to keep that perspective a little bit. We have the ability to earn as much, if not more, than doctors do, lawyers do, anybody who, engineers, whatever. Um, And yet we don't want to invest in our education. Cry me a river. Yeah, I totally agree. We don't want to spend you know, a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks. Yeah, I know. Um, it. When these other professions um, have have invested hundreds of thousands and years before they ever took a new, took a customer. Great point. Love it. So, um, so I recommend getting getting tr- some training in this niche. Um, and then getting your feet wet a little bit, I like. I always recommend go to your sphere, and and get a little bit of experience first, but get training first. Then, if you like it, and if you think that this is you, and you know you feel like you want to take it to the next level, then get certified. And we offer, and we'll go into it later. But you know, it's a six month intense program. This is. Yeah. This is the industry's most intense program. Um, And then learn how to do it right and learn how to be the resource, be the expert that family law attorneys need. This isn't about just prospecting lawyers with a winning script. Um, They're much more wise to that. Lawyers for a living, uh, they you know, tear down people's credibility. I mean, that's what they do for a living. Yep. <laughs> so you're that's not fooling point. anybody. So, so yeah, that's a good point. I mean, my, my business partner, my brother is an attorney. And so he does a lot of divorce cases and it's just so true. I mean, that's all, every conversation is doing what you just said. So once somebody, again, we're going to talk a lot today about your education and how people can work with your team. But w- once people get through that, can you give us a, an understanding of how an agent does serve these attorneys and how they do approach them. That's the question I always get is, okay, let's assume they pay the price. They go through an intensive uh, process. They, they, they become certified. Mm -hmm. What's the mindset or how do we provide value to the family law community? Sure. So first and foremost, it starts with showing up differently, showing up as an expert and having a having your in they call it a cv a curriculum vitae so it's like a beefed up resume sure um in the legal industry all experts have cvs so you need to have a really good one we work with all of our students to build their cv and then scheduling what we call meet and greets i mean it's it's sort of a like you plant seeds and then you water them, but scheduling a meet and greet with them and explaining um, your training, your credentialing, they place a lot of value on education. I mean, hello, sure. they've gone through right. seven years just to get, you know, um, ESQ behind their name. So they, they place a lot of value on it. So explaining to them, you know, why you're different, how you're different. And we, we can, we really serve the industry in three ways. Number one, we're an educator to the family law community, always keeping attorneys on the cusp of what's going on in the real estate industry through emails, through newsletters, through continuing legal education that our students provide. And we keep them always on the forefront of that so that they are in the know um, with their clients. Number two, we are also expert witnesses. So we can provide a lot of forensic research for them and, and, um, and testify as an expert in, on all different types of things that they need with regards to real estate issues in their cases. And then obviously number three is to handle the listing and sale of the property as a neutral third party court appointed expert and we recuse ourselves from dual agency. That's another thing that's very, mm. very big, very important. Um, lawyers cannot comprehend the, the notion that a realtor would represent a buyer and a seller because in their world, that doesn't 
happen. That's right. right? That's right. Yep. They're yep. zealous advocates for their clients. So re- as a realtor, we might be given a lot of power. Um, most of the time, the court orders me to select the list price. Well, along with that power comes a lot of responsibility. What if I've got an investor who is chomping at the bit yeah. to buy a house, which I've got investors coming out of my ears, we all do. And then I say, oh, well, this investor is going to let me double end it. He's also going to let me represent him on the flip. And he might even cut me in on the profits. I've had them. Gre- I mean, we get greased. Absolutely. By, yeah. That's what happens, right? We're getting greased. All at the expense of the homeowner. And so recusing ourselves from dual agency is going to go a long way. We have a code of ethics that every CDRE is held accountable to, and it includes that. I love it. So, um, so there's that. And then we, at the Alumni Institute, we are also the largest real estate organization that uh, educates and provides continuing legal education for family law attorneys. So our CDREs invite all of their attorneys once a month to our um, monthly continuing legal education program. We provide them with, they get an hour of CLEs, their attorneys do. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's a matter of, of you know, like you, ta- like you said earlier, it's a higher level conversation. It's a higher level approach. And um, it, it, it's not about just pounding phones and, you know, dialing for dollars. Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. And, and I'm, I'm sure this is what you teach your students as they go through this process, which again, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, I also get a lot of questions about, you know, what does that process look like to get to be a court appointed, you know, real estate agent, the sound of it, right? Realtors hear that like, oh my gosh, that makes a lot of sense. That's great. It's another shiny object for them to go after, right? So, right. so, but it's very appealing to have a judge say, hey, buyer, or I'm sorry, hey, a hey, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Laurel is going to be your realtor. <laughs> you know, you, you guys, what does that look like? What does it take for you to get that appointment? So first of all, I think there's a, um, there's this perception that there's a list You call up the courthouse and you say, I want to be on the list. And then a judge is going to be, is going to sit there in their black robe on the bench with a case, with a house that needs to be sold. They pull up the list and they go, Oh, Laurel Starks, you're going to be appointed. (laughs) That is not how it happens to become a court appointed listing agent. The way you become a court appointed listing agent is through the attorneys. Mm. So most of the time judges do not, um, name realtors or appoint experts, what they call sua sponte, which is on their own accord. They don't ordinarily do that because judges don't want to be overturned on appeal. So if the judge appoints a realtor and then the realtor screws up, you know, that judge can, can be held accountable for that. And they do not want that. They're not about uh, exposing themselves to more liability. So what, um, so what typically happens, I mean, most of the, and we tra- I teach and train all over the country and ordinarily the way that realtors get involved in cases is um, the judge will say, um, okay, um, you know, to the petitioner or the plaintiff, whatever it's called in your state, um, you are to provide three names to the respondent. And that respondent is to choose who they want and then come back and tell me and then that person is appointed. I will appoint them. Got it. That's how Got it typically it. happens. Makes total sense. Okay. And then how does, from, you know, we're talking a lot about adding value to this family law community. Walk us through maybe just a high level understanding or strategy where uh, pricing property could be used as an asset to provide attorneys value, both, you know, to, to value the marital asset. Um, and maybe how that could be used in court and, and how you could testify, you know, with, with the BPO or with the CMA. Sure. Absolutely. And so, you know, in a family law case, they've got to figure out the value. I mean, they've got an assets and debts declaration or whatever that they need to provide. So they've got to figure out how much debt the whole marital estate is, has, and they need to figure out how much those assets are. So obviously that includes the house. So they need to figure out, okay, where are we going to get the value of the house? Sometimes they will find appraisers 
um, to do it. That's very common. Sometimes they literally will go to Zillow and, mm. and use his estimate, which is craziness. To crazy. Us. But crazy, again, crazy, crazy. they don't know any better. So another way is to have a, is to have a realtor who is an expert. I mean, realtors are experts in valuing property just as much. I would even argue more than appraisers are. Amen. We, we do it for a living. That's right. Right. This is what we do for a living. So what we don't do is, at least I don't, I don't tape a property. So I don't measure it. Right. I, I rely on county records or if the clients provide me with blueprints or something else. Yeah. Um, I also don't test systems. So I don't test the water heater and I don't test the stove and that kind of thing. Um, other than that, we're looking at pretty much the same thing. So I provide a very, and it's, it's a very comprehensive report, but it's nothing that you probably haven't already done. Um, it's a comprehensive CMA and I go out and I take pictures of the property to document everything. And, um, and then I put it all together in a report. Now, the difference is, is that I will testify to it. So if you do these, it, your, your report is not going to be very valuable to them if you won't testify to it. Because if some, if the other side doesn't agree with your value, then they're going to need you to come in and testify. Sometimes in order to get it into evidence, you have to testify to it. Um, so know that if you do these, that saying that you will testify is what's going to really give you that, you know, that leg up. Well, and it comes with a huge responsibility, right? And so oh, yeah. huge. And so would you, would this be something that you would lead uh, in a new relationship with a new attorney as something of value using the law of reciprocity to say, listen, in the meantime, as I'm trying to earn your trust, here's something that I'd be happy to do for you. Is that something you would lead with? Yeah, but I charge for it. So, okay. um, so I will, what, I, so I tell them I do two things. One is I will provide them with a desktop valuation, mm. which means sight unseen. Yes. And I give a range of value. Love it. We can't, there's no way we can foresee or predict what's inside those four walls of a house um, without going to see it. That's so right. I will do a desktop and I will do those. Usually I do them for free. I Usually I waive my fees. It just kind of, I'm at a point where I, I can charge for stuff like, but, right. but most of our CDREs will start um, by doing complimentary desktop valuations. But again, it's a range. Don't lock yourself into a value. It's a range. Yep. Um, so there's that. But then if I do a, um, a full court ready fair market valuation, and I'm going to testify to it, I absolutely charge for the report. I also charge for my testimony time. Love it. I love it. I love it. I heard you say that before and it just makes all the sense in the world. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we could talk days for why that makes sense, but we'll, we'll save that for another conversation. So, so, so an agent step one, get educated. Step two, we're talking about providing value to the family law. Now step three, which is to me, the first interaction with the, the couple, Right. So, yeah. so you, you do everything right. You earn the trust of a divorce attorney who then turns you on to a client. What, what is maybe some of the initial conversations, initial consultations with the consumer uh, that agents need to really pay attention to so that they can stay as that neutral party when having conversations with, with the divorcing couple? I love your questions. This is like so high level. I really appreciate these questions because it's, it's excellent. Um, so number one, know that when you have just gotten the trust of an attorney and the attorney has recommended you, you've got, you've got responsibility on your shoulders. None of us like to give referrals and then have our referral partner make us look bad. Right. Yes. So Remember that. And lawyers don't give out a lot of, they don't give out referrals willy nilly. So, yep. um, so take that responsibility to heart and it isn't about making, it isn't about working harder for that attorney's client. You're not serving that attorney well by aligning with their client. 
Okay. So you are a neutral third party. And when I first start with a client, um, I will have a conversation with them and it's rather matter of fact. And, you know, and I mean, I build some rapport, but I say, you know, my name is Laurel Starks and I was referred to you by so-and-so, or maybe they've called me. It just kind of depends on how the call comes in. But, um, I have a few questions that I would like to ask you. Do you have a few moments? And then I actually have an intake and I'm happy to provide you with the intake that you can send out. Um, and it has a list of questions that, you know, that is there a court order? Is there a restraining order? Like we need to know these things just by asking these questions. You're you've proven you're different than other realtors it. just because you know, to ask these questions. Right. Yes. Um, and then, and I let them know I'm an, I'm a neutral third party and I'm here to ensure that the sale of the property happens fairly and that everyone is treated equally. And so they appreciate that. So then I have another conversation, that same conversation with the other spouse. So I give the other spouse my time and the ability to have their side and perspective and voice heard in just the same questions. It's important to do that because otherwise, if you have gotten all your information from one side and you're just relying on that information, then the other side is going to automatically feel like, well, why are they believing them? Why haven't they even asked me? And you'd be surprised how many times the, um, my intake has two, um, columns, husband and wife, and you would be surprised how many times those two columns do not match up. Mm. One spouse doesn't know about a hidden HELOC. Makes total sense. Um, yeah. You know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, and I also want to know how much they think their house is worth. Right. One side, they might be off by a hundred grand. Yep. Um, then I do a walkthrough with the party living in the house and I'm, it's not a listing appointment. I'm there to assess the house. Think of it like what an appraiser would do. I'm there so that I can prepare a valuation and I can come up with a strategy for this listing. I'm not there to sit down. I'm not there to get chummy. You start doing that and you know, you can start showing them that you're biased towards them, or you can become biased. You know, you listen to somebody's sob story right. and it's very easy to start to become bought in to their story, um, which may or may, they're always two sides to every story. Yeah. And it's not our job to even pick, but they will oftentimes just tell you all the gore, you know, all the gory details. And so I don't even, I, I don't, I don't want to be rude. Um, so I show empathy, but I also am not there to hear that I'm there so that I can see the house. Um, then I do individual listing appointments. So my next listing appointment is with the other spouse. It's not with that same spouse twice, having too much contact with the same spouse um, starts to make the other one feel like they're alienated. It also can make us, make us start to align with one side. So our neutrality is that tightrope that we're always balancing. And our clients oftentimes are trying to pull us in their direction, whether they realize it or not, they're trying to pull us in, in their direction. And we have to make sure that we walk that line very, very, um, very fairly. And if we lose sight of that neutrality, then we've lost control of the listing. I love it. And the thing you just said that, that I align with so well, Laurel is, you know, my life's work is built around teaching people my reverse selling methodology, which is the exact opposite of traditional high pressure selling. And what you said here was, when you meet with people, when you get referred by a divorce attorney, it isn't you're going in there to convince them like a traditional realtor to you're trying to sell them on listing. It's not that mm -mm. this is this is much more of a consultative matter of fact that you said that that's the hardest thing for realtors yeah. with this methodology. It's like going to talk to an attorney when you need one. They almost come off like uh, they're, they're defending the other side of it. What they're trying to do is get information to protect you. 
And what you just suggested is the same thing. You're trying to extract information through using the Socratic method in a way that positions you to serve this case. You're not there to build a friendship. Would you agree with that? Right. Abs- absolutely. That, and is- that is so difficult for, for realtors to learn. So, yeah. right. So let's talk about, so that makes sense. You went through that, that, that three-step process. Let's talk about getting educated. And I think you have two programs and we're going to put a link beneath this video for everybody watching. So you guys can learn about both of these. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of ways and some incentives through our affiliation with Laurel's team where you guys can get involved in just a second. So, so there are two opportunities, I think, to work with your group. Is that right? Correct. All right. So let's talk through what those look like and how it works. So the first one is, um, I actually should say there are three. Um, the first one is really just becoming part of our community. It doesn't cost you a penny. You can do it immediately. Um, we've got a divorce real estate Facebook mastermind group. I do every other week, I do a webinar or we have an Ask the Expert series where I'm interviewing people, uh, professionals, or just people who are going to help your divorce real estate business. Um, that is free. And, um, so I highly recommend you just plug into, you know, plug into that sort of thing. And then, um, we, then for the next step, it is to enroll in our divorce real estate, uh, divorce niche boot camp. So the divorce niche boot camp, it is an online on demand. You can watch it and you can binge watch it over the weekend. And it is a class that was taught by myself and a divorce attorney, divorce attorney, Shelly John, who was one of my lawyers, one of my very first lawyers that I started working with in my first couple of years. And she's now the faculty director at the Alumni Institute. So she and I walk you through the legal process that you need to understand when taking these listings. I walk you through the listing process and how to overcome these objections and what to do step one, step two, step three. And then we do the um, marketing piece, how to maximize your database. So you actually walk away with a 12 month marketing campaign to be able to maximize your database. Because the reality is there are people in your database that are either divorcing or know someone who's getting a divorce. Sure. So we want you to be the person that they think of first. Um, so it is, it is very practical. It is stuff that you can literally take and put into practice immediately. It's not just a bunch of like fluffy content. Um, we also have role plays. So you get to see me doing an intake. You see me doing a listing consultation. You see me doing, you know, overcoming objections with, um, you know, the wife that doesn't want to show the house because, um, she, you know, is, is sabotaging all my showings. Right. So it's, and it's an on-demand video class. Um, and so that is available. You can, you can watch it and it's available to anyone and everyone. Um, so you can manage these listings. Then the next step is to become a certified divorce real estate expert, a CDRE. It is our mission and it's my vision at the Alumni Institute for the future of divorce real estate to be where CDREs are the only realtors that are appointed or that handle listings in divorce cases. So we, it is a six month program. You have to, there's minimum application requirements. We've got a very thorough vetting process, um, including a whole application file you turn in, um, have a, a um, an interview with one of our family law attorneys. And then if you're accepted into the program, it starts with what we call master course, which is really kind of a fire hose nosedive into it's a live class. We used to do it live here, but through COVID we're doing it online, but it's live. All your cameras are on. It's like a classroom and it's with our entire alumni faculty. So it's three attorneys, a judge, myself, and then a um, certified divorce financial um, uh, div- mortgage professional. And we teach you, we go deep, deep, deep into the anatomy of divorce, neutrality training, mediation training, um, divorce listing training. And then we, um, and so 
we also break you up into tribes. And so you will have a small group tribe that is led by one of our family law attorneys for six months after master course, then it continues on and we teach you and, and coach you, um, on building your business and continuing your learning. So we have got a complete, we have a CDRE dashboard that includes literally step-by-step -step checklists on what to take, um, all the way down to what kind of paper to print it on and what kind of folder to put it in. I mean, it's extremely micro. Um, and we help you build a CV. Um, we help you build your attorney database and then teach you exactly how to service it broken up into 90 day rounds. And then we have got our raising the bar series, which I kind of alluded to earlier, which is, um, the, our monthly, we put on a monthly continuing legal, CLE, continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the country that you can invite your attorneys to. And because if you're a CD an active CDRE, you're a sponsor. So it's $55 for the attorney to attend. But if you're one of our CDREs, it's waived. Um, you get VIP guest passes to give to your lawyers. So it is, um, and then we, and then we just help you. Like I was just on the phone prior to this with, um, Harold, he's one of our amazing CDREs in the Bay area, and he is putting on a, um, he's the guest speaker at the San Fran at the San Francisco bar association this Friday. And so we're helping him put together his whole, you know, speaking, um, um, program for that. Um, and so we are just, we are obsessed with the success of our CDREs. It's what we live for. We're a very tight knit community. Our CDREs, um, become very, very close with one another and help, you know, we have masterminds, um, monthly and case studies that we go over. It's just, you, you really become like a, you know, this, is this becomes your practice. I love it. I mean, that is, I mean, you gave me goosebumps because I love the niche so much. You, to your point earlier, um, the the family law community has been underserved by our industry for so long, and the work that you and your team are doing uh, is going to fix that. Is going to fix that. So I will link to everything that Laurel just talked about beneath this video for everybody. Um, so make sure you guys check that out. Make sure you join her Facebook group. And so really quick, I just want to, I want to talk about the business model from a yeah. standpoint of what, what, what is the opportunity there? Meaning if they, if they work exclusively with one divorce attorney, um, I know it's hard to say, but what, what is that? What could that look like as far as business monthly annually? Is that one listing a year? Could that be one listing a month? You know, and I know it's hard to say, but generally speaking, uh, what does these partnerships typically look like? Yeah. So, um, again, like you said, it definitely depends on, um, you know, on how well you're serving your community and, um, and we recommend as a CDRE that our CDREs look at it, not just as one attorney, but as an attorney, um, but as, as the family law community as a whole, Absolutely. because it's not just one attorney who gets you on a case that attorney has to convince their client has to convince the opposing counsel who has sure. to convince their client so when the whole community knows who you are it makes it so much easier this is a long game this is not something where you start getting your business is tripling within six months right it is a long game but it's also a very secure i mean you know, I get business that just comes in to me all the time. And, um, it's not because I've, you know, it's just because of my reputation in the community. So it is, it's a long game. Um, so, uh, which again is another reason why realtors fail at it because we are so about instant gratification. 100%. I, mean, I want to put a Facebook ad and I better start getting leads in the next, you know, 24 hours or I'm pulling it. Um, so this isn't that, but um, I, I, I call it, it's almost like the difference between the slot machines, which is like Zillow, Facebook, whatever, and like an IRA, right? Yeah, an yeah, IRA yeah. is just, you have to be slow and steady. And you get, you know, right. big rewards, but over a long period of time. Um, so 
you know, how much can you, how much can you get? I mean, it, it can, like I said, it's just very difficult to, to predict. We've got agents who have gotten, you know, multiple listings within their six months. Um, we've had some agents who have taken, it's been over a year before they got their first listing, but it's just all about consistency over time. And, um, and it becomes, it's a profitable business because the, the lead generation costs, um, are relatively low compared to what a lot of other lead gen costs are here. So it's a very profitable business. Um, but you know, every divorce attorney has got, you know, I mean, divorce attorneys have, they do insane volume, like right. divorce lawyers will have, you know, a hundred to 200 cases at a time in wow. all, yeah. In all different levels of activeness. Some of them are on the back burner because there's not trial until November or whatever, right? But they have got a lot of cases. So, um, so you know, it is, the potential is, the potential is huge. And I think you nailed it. It's, it's not like, if an agent looks at this and says, what can I get? That's the wrong mindset. It's yeah. what can you give? Yeah. is that will be the result, right? I, I'm a huge believer of the law of reciprocity and you can, and there's no way around it. And I think what you're suggesting is it's more about how much you give to this community without expecting anything in return will be what you get in return. That's right. Yeah, that's, yeah, it makes a ton of sense. That's exactly right. And what we're doing right now is we are, our CDREs are a family of trailblazers. And they are in their communities, changing the way that lawyers look at realtors, changing the way that they utilize our services. And it's becoming more and more commonplace. So it's a great time to really get in on the ground level of, 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 chain, of change. Um, and being that person who's, who's helping that. But, you know, anybody, you know, you go ask anybody who's blazed a trail and it's work. Yeah. I love it. Laurel, this was so much fun. I, I want to thank you again for your commitment to this industry, the expertise and the, and the, what your team does to make our industry better. Um, it was a lot of fun today. Thank you. I had a lot of fun too. And I have to say that I, um, I love, you know, your approach very much aligns with our approach as well. And, um, and it's refreshing to see that. And so we would love to have your community um, become involved in our community. And so, um, you know, any, any way that we can help support that and facilitate that um, and, and help your people, um, we, would, we would love to do. It's a great fit. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's exactly what's going to happen is our communities are going to get aligned. And I think there's a lot of um, parallels into yeah. your teachings and my teachings. And so I'll, I'm, I'm looking forward to starting this partnership with you and this relationship with you. I'm just very, very excited about it. We are too. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely.